My name is Rebecca Riley, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, I am super excited to learn more about the connections between the Gold Rush and the 1906 San Francisco. Um, with all earthquake science today, I think it'll be a great lecture. Uh, AMSI is committed to sparking, sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations. And to help everybody out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are please visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of our science activities, please send us photos or videos so we can see what wonderful scientists y'all are. Uh, and that's true for people of all ages. It doesn't just have to be young humans doing these science activities. Uh, I also hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by Rowan and the Billy Goat. You can hear them live at Kendall Concerts in Omsi's Planetarium and they are currently scheduled for January 28th, 2021. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. So I would like to give a big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Club. We really appreciate them.
Uh, we would love to welcome you back into the museum to experience body worlds and the cycle of life and also tour the USS Blueback submarine. Oh, I want my slide to play, but it's not doing it. Um, advanced tickets are required. The health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority. And we want you to feel comfortable and safe while you're at OMSI. So to meet state guidelines and help limit the spread of COVID-19, um, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum. Please visit omsi.edu for more information on Body Worlds. We are also very excited to host our first virtual version of an OMSI After Dark called Zest Fest. So let's all get together and virtually enjoy some delicious spicy foods. Tickets are $50 and that includes a mix of hot sauces and spicy snacks enough for two or more to share during the event. And then there's plenty to enjoy the rest of the month. You can pick up, pick up your box at OMSI for $15 or for $15 extra, you can ship it to your home anywhere in the US. We'll have a live two hour virtual program on Friday, July 24th from seven to 9 p.m. where you can see some science demonstrations, some hot sauce experts, music, fire eaters, live ice carving and more. It'll be a real fun variety show and we'll walk you through tasting all of your delicious hot sauces. If you're interested, please go to omsi.edu slash zestfest for more information. Um, for Zestfest, aka tonight, if you want to have some delicious snacks and drinks, uh, you can put the pub back in Science Pub while still supporting your local community. So here is a list of wonderful food and beverage partners from around the state that you should check out because they're delicious. Tonight will look a lot like our usual Science Pub program and almost exactly like our usual virtual Science Pub program. Um, what this will look like is first, we're going to begin with an earthquake themed trivia game. That'll be a warm up for tonight's talk. So you can grab a pen and paper, or you can just shout out your answers, um, gather your quarantine team so you can play against them. And then after that, we'll have a lecture by Dr. Ross Stein. Um, and throughout the lecture, if you have any questions at all, you can submit them via the comments in our live feed and we'll collect all of your questions. And after the lecture, we'll have a Q and A and we'll ask the Dr. Stein all of your questions. If you do enjoy tonight's lecture, or if you love OMSI, uh, please consider making a donation or purchasing a science pub pint glass, as you can see shown on the screen there, they're pretty adorable. Uh, we'll post the links in the comments section for more information on donating and on getting a pint class. But don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our main mission here at OMSI is uh, inspiring curiosity and creating engaging science learning experiences for all ages. So please sit back and relax and get ready for a great lecture. But first, before the lecture, it's trivia time! I would like this week to introduce our featured hall manager to play along at home. So please give a warm welcome to Jennifer Powers. Hey, Jen. Hey, Rebecca. How are you? I'm doing great. Jen is beaming in live from OMSI, her office at OMSI, because she's running that Body Worlds exhibit. <laughs> also come see Body Worlds. It's great. You're, everybody's getting a little added bonus of a, a backstage tour of the OMSI building. You can see what a staff office looks like. Very exciting. Lots of clipboards, lots of things on the wall, even have a snake on the ceiling. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you ready to do some trivia? I am very ready to do some earthquake trivia, yes. Awesome. Okay. okay. We're going to jump right in. Okay. First question. Why was the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey sent to California in 1850? A, to map the gold fields in the Sierras. B, to map the coastline and harbors for ship traffic, or C, to map a railway route from the Midwest to the gold fields? Oh, man. Well, the postage stamp makes me feel like it's about harbors. There are ships on that stamp. There are ships on that stamp. But I also know that they're gathering good information. It's about gold. And uh, so I guess A. Ooh, you know, you have a great gut feeling. Oh, no! <laughs> Pretty good at picking up other sorts of things to help you answer a question. Oh. Because they needed boats to bring people to yes. gold. 
I, I guess think- it was all about gold. They just wanted to sail to the gold. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Expression. <laughs> Correct. Woo woo. Okay. So good so far. So good. Ready for the next one. <laughs> Uh, roughly how many ships were seen anchored in the San Francisco Bay in 1847, just before the gold rush? Just before the gold rush? Uh, big hint, the next question is going to ask about the number of ships after the gold rush. Got so. it. Well, I'm going to assume very few ships before the gold rush, but a lot of... And that is a great assumption. There were not too many ships there. And you can kind of see on this picture, there's not too many houses or buildings either. Oh, San Francisco looks a little different. Yeah, people weren't doing a whole lot there before gold was found. Now, let's see, after gold was found, five, only five years later in 1853, how many ships were seen anchored in San Francisco Bay? 50, 100, or 700? 700 seems like so many ships for 1853. Did 1853 have 700 ships? 100 ships? There was like gold there, Jen. 700 ships? (laughs) (laughs) Really? (laughs) The sea was carpeted in ships. I mean, I get that. If there was gold then, I'd take my non-existent ship to San Francisco Bay. <laughs> I'd find a ship. I'd find a ship and then go. Find a ship and go get some gold. I probably wouldn't, honestly, but I would like to have a ship. So I'd probably just go oh, okay. for funsies. I'll share with you. Maybe we'll take a detour and we'll go the, all the way down to the Galapagos or something. <laughs> as long as we can bring our dogs, we'll have some ship dogs. Yes, please. <laughs> Um, so all those gold rush ships, why weren't they sailed back home to pick up more miners after they arrived in San Francisco? Were okay. they then used to ferry miners on to Sacramento? Okay. Or was it because the sailing crew could make 10 times the wages as miners, so the crews abandoned the ships and no one was left to sail them home? Or the ships were sold so timber could be used for housing and building? Okay. Oh no. They're they're building stuff. Well no, they're mining in that picture. I'm trying to use the picture to guess. Um, I don't know. I guess they could probably make more money. So they stopped sailing. Uh you are correct. Yeah. yeah. The sailors just abandoned ship, uh, as they say. <laughs> Went to make <laughs> money. Good one, Rebecca. <laughs> I don't think that was funny at all. This is why I don't do puns. <laughs> Leave the puns to John Farmer, for sure. Yeah, I think that was just a statement. I don't think that counted as a pun. <laughs> but maybe maybe I got a laugh from somebody. Okay, let's try. You are, I think you're five out of five. Four out of five. Four out of five. You're in like, percent. I'm like three out of four with your help. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is a question about parts of San Francisco. So these three things I'm about to say are all parts of the San Francisco Peninsula. What do Yerba Buena Cove, Mission Bay, and the Marina all have in common? And there can be more than one correct answer here. Okay. Uh, A, they are today's sites of the financial district, the tech boom, and the singles pickup boom. B, the land there is either artificial fill or soft muds, which greatly amplifies the shaking and large quakes. Or C, these are the safest places in San Francisco to live. Ah, I feel like I wish it was C, but I'm going to pick both A and B. I'm going to go for A and B? Yeah. You are right. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't have to give any hints for that one. You just got it. Yeah. (laughs) Not that I've been giving, I didn't, I've never had to give hints. You would have gotten. Definitely don't ever. I shouldn't uh, (laughs) say things like that. (laughs) Yeah. Relying on your smarts. Okay, what did Jack London think led to the greatest damage in the greatest in the great 1906 earthquake? Was there more damage from the shaking of the earthquake or from fire that happened after the shaking? Fire. Fire. Yeah, yeah. this picture looks kind of because like that looks like by some fire. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Fire. That's Ooh, that's intense. Are those all fire clouds? They must be. I think we call that smoke, Rebecca. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they know it. They call them fire clouds. And yes, there's, there's many fire clouds. <laughs> Big old fire cloud rolling on in. Okay. <laughs> Number seven. What is a right lateral fault? Oh. Does it mean that A, whatever side you are on, the other side moves to the right? Or B, the land on both sides of the fault move to the right? Uh, B. If both of those sides are moving in the same direction. A. <laughs> is there a fault? <laughs> I'm trying no. to it just kind of goes like this. Whichever side you're on, the other side moves to the right? Sure. Yes. <laughs> ah, yeah. So this is kind of like my right is your left. Okay. You flip and look the other way. Got it. Yeah. I should, I should know more about earthquakes. I grew up in oh. Olympia, Washington. We have a lot of earthquakes. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, now you're learning. There's never too late. Um, this is why we have adult education here at OMSI. We are never done learning. This is why I have a job. <laughs> okay. You're okay. almost there. You've been doing so great, girl. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> was the movement of land in San Francisco Bay area did okay. So let me start over. Yeah. The area in the San Francisco Bay Area, did the land only move in 1906 or also at other times? So did it only move in 1906 or did it also move during the 50 years before the quake, during the quake, and 10 years after the quake? I mean, yeah, it's moving all the time. Just in 1906, it did a lot of moving. Yeah, you're right. The land is always kind of moving around. Um, just don't stop. <laughs> Okay, so I was also looking at sort of before and after that 1906 earthquake. Mm -hmm. do, do you think the rate of large Bay Area quakes, how does it compare for the 75 years before 1906 to the 75 years after 1906? So do you think there was 10 times more earthquakes before that 1906 earthquake? About the same either way? Or were there 10 times more earthquakes after that 1906 one? Hmm. Wow. Well, that surprised me. I don't know if that helps you in any way. <laughs> I guess I don't know. I'm basing my I'm basing my guess on volcanoes and the fact that you get a lot of buildup and have a lot of earthquakes before volcanoes until like the big eruption. So that's my guess is that there would be a lot of little movements leading up to one big movement and then some rest. You are smarter than me. Well, I already knew that, but yeah, you got it. That's crazy. More earthquakes before than after. Oh, wow. that's Which, awesome. Maybe I mean, this oh, is- Because huh? earthquakes are a little scary, but yeah. that's a really cool fact. Um, okay, final question. You've been doing amazing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> How did H.F. Reed's discoveries from the 1906 earthquake foretell and propel the plate tectonic revolution a half a century later? Okay. Uh, did Reed find that the Bay Area had expanded or dilated and plate tectonics involves the expansion and contraction of the crust? Okay. Or did Reed deduce that the San Andreas must have slipped hundreds of miles in a right lateral sense since its inception? We've seen the words right lateral before, and mm -hmm. I know that plate tectonics involve a lot of slipping, so I'm going to beat. Bow, 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 bow. <laughs> Tenth question correct. <sighs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, you were an incredible trivia guest. I'm so glad you could join us.
Me too. Uh, well, and that you're multitasking, you're working and triviaing at the same time. We really what appreciate it. What a you. great thing to do at work, to take a little <laughs> break and answer some questions before a science pub. I wish that I could stick around and watch Dr. Stein's presentation. You'll have to fill me in later. I'll fill you in later. Actually, luckily, Jen, every science pub is recorded. So anybody oh. watching at home, if you want to rewatch this or if you have friends or family you want to share this with, they can also watch it at home on either Facebook or YouTube whenever they like. That's such a good plug and I think for me to remember. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch it later. <laughs> All right. I'm off to go around body worlds. Have a great night. Uh, have a great night. Bye, Jen. Bye. Okay. So now that we have finished up with that amazing trivia, I would like to introduce our speaker. Ross Stein is CEO and co-founder of Tembler Incorporated, a, catastroph a catastrophe modeling company, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and Geological Society of America. Stein received the Gilbert White Award from the American Geophysical Union and the Eugene Shoemaker Distinguished Achievement Award from the U.S. Geological Survey. Ross is one of the 2021 IRIS slash SSA, also known as Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology slash Seismological Society of America. That's a club I want to join. Uh, he's one of their distinguished lecturers, which is a program that receives support from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Stein also gave a wide 2012 TEDx talk called Defeating Earthquakes and has given the Francis Birch Lecture, the Gilbert White Lecture, a Centennial Plenary Lecture, and the Frontiers of Geophysics Lecture, which are all keynote presentations at annual meetings of the American Geophysical Union. In 2003, the Science Citation Index reported that Stein was the second most cited author in earthquake science during the preceding decade. In 2009, Stein co-founded the Global Earthquake Model, or the GEM Foundation, and serves on the Resilient America Roundtable of the National Academy of Sciences. So, Dr. Stein, thank you so much for being here, and please take it away. Thank you. This is a San Francisco story. Thank you. This is a San Francisco story about what was discovered there, what was suffered there, and how they combined to change our understanding of the world. Now, as a resident of the Bay Area, I can tell you that everything we love about the San Francisco Bay Area has been brought to us by the faults. Napa Valley, Silicon Valley, and Carmel Valley, Tamales Bay, San Francisco Bay, and Monterey Bay, even Lake Tahoe. Absent the San Andreas and Hayward Faults, there would be no San Francisco Bay, the only deep water port along the California coastline, and so the wellspring of the gold rush. The Hayward Fault lifts up the Oakland and Berkeley Hills with their magnificent sunset views of the Golden Gate. The San Gregorio Fault makes Big Sur big. A bend in the San Andreas thrust up the Santa Cruz Mountains, the spine of the peninsula, and the Marin Headlands. These coastal ranges temper our climate, bathe us in fog, and crown us in redwoods. What I want you to see is that we enjoy the fruits of the faults every day. So we have to live with their occasional spoils, as befell the Bay Area in 1868, most famously in 1906, and most recently in 1989. You'll learn tonight, although we cannot predict earthquakes, we know why and where the hazard is high, and we can erect structures that can withstand anything the faults can hurl at them. And I will leave you with the means to assess your own seismic risk to assure the safety of your own family. Now, this is the world bequeathed to us in the plate tectonic revolution of the mid-1960s. It was the realization that the surface of the Earth is not fixed and rigid, but highly mobile, moving at fractions of an inch to several inches a year. Where the plates pull apart from each other and are born are these globe-encircling 
mid-ocean ridges in lime yellow, and where they collide with each other are the subduction zones in magenta. And there, the denser of the two opposing plates gets shoved under the lighter one. And these are the hatcheries of the world's greatest earthquakes. Now, the evidence that the surface of the earth had to be mobile was thrown down by the 1906 earthquake. But that evidence never would have arrived had it not been for the gold rush 50 years beforehand. And it's the serendipitous combustion of those elements that forms the story I want to tell you tonight. Thank you. This is a San Francisco story. Sutter's Mill. It seemed they were foretelling the tech boom 100 years later rather than the gold rush in that line below. And as soon as the federal army assayed the gold and announced that it was the real thing, it launched the largest armada of ships the world had ever known, with 60,000 people abandoning their homes, their jobs, and their families, boarding ships, typically sailing halfway around the world to go through the Golden Gate and reach the gold fields. And this is how it was supposed to work. There'd be miners out on the edge of, of the Golden Gate, and they'd wave the ships in with a hanky. But actually, it didn't work out that way because the Golden Gate is some of the most treacherous water of the entire coastline with dense fog, shallows, currents that were often faster than these boats could sail and high winds. And so after these enormous voyages, many of the ships like this one came to grief outside the Golden Gate. And there's no wonder because if you look at a contemporary a merchant marine map or navigation map at the time, this looks nothing like the California coastline. And what's worse, the ship captain was supposed to line up the ship so that he could see Alcatraz in the middle and shoot the rapids into the bay. And it just didn't work out well. So what happened is that the federal government sent the Coast and Geodetic Survey out to California to make decent shipping navigation maps so these people actually could get safely into San Francisco Bay. So when you made maps in the 1850s, and in fact, all the way until the 1970s, with the development of the laser, one could not measure long distances. You couldn't do it. So what you did instead was measure angles. So they would put up monuments on mountaintops and promontories and they would measure the angle difference between two or three other promontories. And you'd make a spider web of these points. And ultimately, those points could only be in a certain location to have those angles to everything around it. And so this is how the map was constructed right after the gold rush in 1850 to 1854. And whenever better instruments and lighter instruments were developed, the Coast and Genetic Survey came out again and resurveyed everything in an attempt to make still more accurate maps. Now, there's a peculiarity of what happens if you make a map by turning angles, and it's this. Imagine I put this square here, and I paint this square, let's say, on a balloon, and I inflate the balloon. Have any of those angles changed? No. This means that if you were making maps by turning angles, if the ground expanded or contracted, you couldn't see it. You were completely insensitive to that. Nobody thought the ground was moving, but if it were, you'd be, it, it wouldn't be something you could detect. But what about if the ground sheared? Now what, look what happens. Two of those angles get smaller and two get larger. So just as an accident of making maps by triangulation, the method is very sensitive to shearing of the land, which no one thought was occurring, and utterly insensitive to expansion or contraction. So here's the first map that was produced in 1856. It's really a work of art and science. It has topography, it has bathymetry, soundings. What I love about a geodetic survey map of this era, it even has sailing directions and alerts you to the dangers coming in. So you could see how mission focused this map was. And here's San Francisco 
right after the gold rush. Let's take a closer look. So here's the city in 1853. So that's three years after the gold rush began. The city had gone from a hundred from 15,000 people to 150,000 in a year and a half. And at the time this map was made, the city had burned down to the ground already twice. Now you can also see Yerba Buena Cove, which was the principal anchorage for the gold rush shipping, but some of the ships went to the south to Mission Bay and others went to the marina in the north. Now what's ironic about that is to consider what the view was looking into Yerba Buena just before the gold rush. And so here is the city a few years before the gold rush, half a dozen ships in port, and about 25 or 30 houses or buildings in San Francisco. Now let me show you this picture a few years after the gold rush began, taken a photograph taken from the shore looking out at Yerba Buena Cove. Look how densely populated San Francisco already is just a few years later. And look at the number of ships in port. There are about 70 ships in this picture. Now let me show you the city two years later. And now it's almost incalculable how many ships are here, but there are 700. And I want you to look again. These ships are rotting in place. They're falling apart. And that's because the moment those ships dropped anchor in Yerba Buena Cove, the paying passengers raced off the boats, boarded steam ferries to take them to Sacramento and Stockton, and from there into the gold fields. And so did the crew, because the wages of a miner were about 10 times higher than the wages of a sailor. So there was nobody to sail these boats home, and none of them ever left port again. And it's astonishing when you consider that this was the most lucrative merchant marine route in the world, but they were all one-way ships. And the city just dumped sand from what was what is today Golden Gate Park on top of these rotting hulks of these gold rush ships. And they're still there today. So for example, here's one that was um, exhumed at the foot of the Transamerica Tower uh, 20 years ago from just this episode. Now let's go back to that map of San Francisco and compare the coastline to what it is today. And you can see all of this artificial or made land. And now you know that almost all of it is simply sand on top of the rotting hulk of gold rush ships. And so this made land is extremely weak. And in an earthquake, as struck in 1906, and again in 1989, these are the areas that shook the hardest. And it's ironic that Yerba Buena Co, today's financial district, the site of the finance boom, Mission Bay and its marsh, Soma, the site of the tech boom, and Marina, the site of the singles pickup boom, are all in this special category of terrible land. Well, everything changed for the city on April 18th, 1906. And the most beautiful contemporary account of the earthquake was written by Jack London, who lived in Oakland. And I'd just like to read you a passage from his story uh, while we look at some of the contemporary photographs of the disaster. San Francisco is gone. Nothing remains of it but memories and a fringe of dwelling houses on its outskirts. Its industrial section is wiped out. Its business section is wiped out. Its social and residential section is wiped out. The factories and warehouses, the great stores and newspaper buildings, the hotels and the palaces of the nabobs are all gone. Remains only the fringe of dwelling houses on the outskirts of what was once San Francisco. On Wednesday morning at a quarter past five came the earthquake. A minute later, the flames were leaping upward. In a dozen different quarters south of Market Street, in the working class ghetto and in the factories, fires started. There was no opposing the flames. There was no organization, no communication. All the cunning adjustments of a 20th century city had been smashed by the earthquake. 
An enumeration of the buildings destroyed would be a directory of San Francisco. An enumeration of the buildings undestroyed would be a line and several addresses. An enumeration of the deeds of heroism would stock a library and bankrupt the Carnegie Medal Fund. An enumeration of the dead will never be made. All vestiges of them were destroyed by the flames. I went inside with the owner of a house on the steps of which I sat. He was cool and cheerful and hospitable. Yesterday morning, he said, I was worth $600,000. This morning, this house is all I have left. It will go in 15 minutes. He pointed to a large cabinet. That is my wife's collection of China. This rug upon which we stand is a present. It cost $1,500. Try that piano. Listen to its tone. There are few like it. The flames will be here in 15 minutes. There are no horses. And he was right. But after the earthquake, geologists from Stanford and Berkeley, from the US Geological Survey and Johns Hopkins University started to walk the path of destruction north and south out of the city. And this, to their astonishment, is what they found, a tear or rent in the landscape. This is near the base of Tamales Bay to the north. And incidentally, this woman, Alice Eastwood, single-handedly saved the botany collection of the California Academy of Sciences from the fire. And the photo was made by the US Geological Survey's most famous geologist, G.K. Gilbert. And wherever they looked, they found the fault they saw something remarkable, that when there was a line of fences, like you see on the left, or a road, or a line of trees, they were offset so that these two yellow points used to be side by side. And they're offset in a certain sense, which is that whichever side you're on, the other side has been shoved to the right. And that amount of displacement varied from about six feet to 12 feet but along the entire 250 mile long fault that they discovered, they found this same right lateral offset, which they christened at this time. And then they said, okay, we're seeing this offset. So it, maybe it'll show up in those genetic survey maps. So let's resurvey all those coastal promontories and mountaintops and see if we can see the effect of this movement that we're seeing right along the fault. And here are some of those points that have been surveyed in the 50 years or so before the earthquake, including just about 1900, not long before the earthquake occurred. And if I draw a perpendicular dotted line to the San Andreas and put the vector of the motion of all these points on that line, here's what they found. Sure enough, when you cross the fault, it has this right lateral motion of about 12 feet. But if you got, as you move farther and farther away, toward the ocean or toward the inland, the displacements get smaller and smaller. The whole crust isn't moving. It's like the fault leaped ahead, but if you get farther enough away, you don't see anything anymore. So it was mysterious, but it confirmed this right lateral slip of the earthquake. And then H.F. Reed from John Hopkins said, wait a minute, why don't we go back to those geodetic survey maps that were made in the 50 years before the earthquake and see during that time period, was there any motion? And here's what he found. All these points had been moving all along. And if you just put those along a dotted line and slide them into position, you can see something remarkable and remarkably simple. The whole area had been caught in a giant sheer vice. The whole area was moving. The earthquake wasn't the whole show. Now, think back about how these maps were made. The only reason that Reed could make this fantastic discovery is because of this weird attribute that if you make maps out of turning angles, you're sensitive to shearing of the ground, and that's all you're sensitive to. And think back that he never would have had these observations, even the pre-1906 earthquake observation, had it not been for the gold rush. So these two elements conspired together to give this enormous insight. But Reed was truly a great scientist and he went further. He said, okay, 
let's imagine that this wasn't just going on in the 50 years before the earthquake. What if it had been going on for 250 years before the earthquake? Then the Farallon Islands out to the west would have moved 12 feet with respect to Mount Diablo on the east. And if now if we add the displacements that they measured during the earthquake, those are the yellow vectors, everything gets really simple. It's just an offset across the fault. And if he's right, if he were right, then it would mean that the fault has to be moving on average about an inch a year. So the whole thing is being sheared, but the fault has friction and the fault resists motion. And eventually that friction is overcome by the stress of all that shear and bang, the fault catches up. So it doesn't leap ahead, it catches up. But now here's the powerful insight of an inch a year. That seems like a really little number, doesn't it? But think about it. Even at his time, when the Earth was believed to be 10 million years old, if this had been going on at an inch a year for 10 million years, that would have meant that the San Andreas would have had to slip right laterally 150 miles. Completely incompatible with everybody's view of the Earth as fixed and rigid. But Reed, as a good scientist, said, I, don't, I can't explain it, but that's the observation. And he planted that seed, and 60 years later, it germinated into the theory of plate tectonics. So with Reed's insight in mind, we can go back to the Bay Area and see it's not just the San Andreas. There's a whole series of parallel faults, all right lateral, all caught in this giant shear vice. So the Hayward earthquake in 1868, also part of the same process, and then the San Andreas earthquake in 1906. But there's one other leap, great leap that Reed made. He said, okay, we don't have to wait around for earthquakes to know where the earthquake risk is highest. What we should be doing is measuring the strain. If there is high strain, as he found here, ultimately an earthquake has to occur. And today, with continuously recording GPS receivers, 30,000 of them around the globe. That's exactly what we do. So here's the globe that we have today. And all these bright colors are where the shear strain is highest. And the blue colors are where the shear strain is lowest. And you can see Japan, and you can see the Philippines down here, Japan here. And this is India crashing into Tibet. And you can see individual faults. So India has been in a 40 million year long collision with China and has pushed up the roof of the earth to bet in the process. And there are individual faults you can see illuminated by their shear. And if we spin again, we see the great North Anatolian fault, San Andreas's sister that produced the most spectacular falling domino sequence of earthquakes the world has ever known. And if we spin again, we see the North American Cordillera and the San Andreas system and the uh, subduction system in the Northwest. So this view of the earth all is a wonderful accidental occurrence of the gold rush of map making techniques of the occurrence of the earthquake that's opened people's eyes to what an earthquake is display permanent displacement of the ground, and then the brilliance of Harry Fielding Reed. Now what I'd like to do is delve a little deeper into this idea of what is the earthquake machine? Why does the fault not just slip along regularly? Why does it sit there for so many hundreds of years before we have an earthquake? And are there any clues that we can use to figure out once one earthquake has occurred, what could happen next? So now let me take you to that demo. So let me introduce you to the earthquake machine. So this machine has everything you need to create earthquakes, but nothing extraneous. And there are only four elements. The first is the steady motion of the plate's interiors, which are driving the slip along the faults. And that's represented by this casting reel. And I'm just pulling in this line. And that line is attached to a rubber band. And that rubber band represents the rubberiness, the elasticity of the Earth's crust. 
Believe it or not, it's elastic, but just very stiff elastic material. And finally, it's connected to these kitchen countertop samples, this mass, which is going to move in an earthquake, and it's sitting on a industrial strength frictional surface. And I've sandblasted the bottom of these bricks, so there's rough friction there. All right, so now what I'm going to do is crank as steadily as I can, and I just want you to watch what happens. Okay, so you saw that the bricks sat there for several hundred years and then bang, they moved during an earthquake and then they'd sit again. There's nothing I can do in this experiment to keep those bricks moving constantly. They always produce earthquakes as long as these elements are here. So now let me ask you a question. Were all the earthquakes separated by the same amount of time? No. Were they all the same size if we measure size by how much they slipped? No, this is very bad news. If I can't make regular repeating earthquakes with Home Depot sandpaper rubber band and bricks, we're never gonna get them in the earth because the earth has much more variability than you see here. The rubberiness comes from material properties, granite, basalt, sediments, they're different. Faults have, are grungy and have bends and breaks, some are smooth, some are rough. So they'll, they'll be different too. And the amount of mass involved changes from place to place. So that means that we can never talk about earthquakes as being 10 months pregnant. They're not regular. They're not periodic. And that is the bitter pill that seismologists have had to swallow in the last 50 years of research on earthquake prediction. Okay, let me ask you another question. What if I repeat the experiment, but now I take one brick off. So now I've got only half the mass over here, but same elasticity, same friction, and I crank at the same speed. Am I going to get smaller earthquakes or larger? Frequent, more frequent, or less? And I think you can see here, you still get earthquakes, but they are smaller, maybe half the size, and they are about twice as frequent. And that makes sense because the resistance is only half what it was before. So the spring gets to the tension where it can overcome resistance and we get an earthquake, but it hasn't stressed as much, stretched as much, so we don't get as large a slip as before. And we have places on the San Andreas that can produce two brickers, like where the 1906 earthquake occurred in Northern California or the 1857 earthquake in Southern, both about 7.7, 7.8 events. And we have places on the San Andreas that are one brickers, Parkfield, which produces a magnitude six to six and a half earthquake every 20 to 40 or so years. Again, variable in terms of its occurrence, but all smaller. Now let me take one step further. You can see that this surface is shiny because it's been polished. This surface we sandblasted to make it rough. So what if I just turn this over so now I have the same friction down below. I've got the same uh, stiffness in the spring. I'm gonna crank at the same rate and we have a one bricker as before. Now what are we gonna get? Are we gonna get earthquakes? Are they smaller or larger? Or are we just gonna get it to creep along without earthquakes? And I think what you can see here is that it's not purely creeping. It has little staccato earthquakes that are accompanied, but it's largely creep. Little, little earthquakes you see now and then. And we have that section on the San Andreas too. It's called the creeping section. It's 100 miles long and extends from south of the Bay Area to Parkfield. And it produces more earthquakes than anywhere else on the fault. But they're all small and they're accompanied by creep. And just like this experiment, one side of the fault has high friction, it's granite. The other side of the fault, low friction, it's clay. So this is also seen. Now you might say, okay, that's great if earthquakes are in isolation, but earthquakes aren't normally in isolation. And we have a long fault. San Andreas is almost a thousand miles long. And we even the biggest earthquakes we've seen are only a couple hundred miles. So what about earthquakes communicating with each other down the fault? What happens when one earthquake occurs? Does that load things up for the next one? So now I'm going to show you that by creating three of them in series, and they're connected by rubber bands, 
just like the first one is, okay? So now the question for you is, which is gonna go first, which second, and which third? You ready? It gets really interesting really fast, right? This guy went actually first, second, and third until he had loaded up this guy. Then this guy went, then this guy went. But some of the times, they all went together. And that further greatly complicates the problem of earthquake prediction because no little earthquake knows it's marked for future greatness. Whether or not it takes its siblings along for the ride or not isn't clear. But under some circumstances, we can have a cascade that ultimately produces a very large earthquake, but more often than not, we get individual small events. And in 1992 in Southern California, in the Mojave Desert, we had an earthquake, Landers, and occurring on three closely connected faults that on a good day could have produced a six and a half, but they all got together in 30 seconds and produced a 7.3. So this happens, and when it happens, it produces much larger earthquakes. Now, the final thing I want to show you is perhaps the most important in terms of what we can say. If we can't predict an earthquake, after a big earthquake has occurred, can we say where the hazard is now higher, where earthquakes are now more likely, and where less? So now I'm going to go back to the two bricker spot. I'm going to get it just about ready to go, and I'm going to ask you the question, what happens if I lift the top brick? It goes, right? Because I've unclamped the fault, the faces that keep it in contact. My fault is like this, the San Andreas is like this. So if, if by a nearby earthquake I can transfer stress that tends to unclamp the fault, not even lifting a brick, just shaving a brick, and the fault is close to failure, I can trigger an earthquake. And by the same token, if I'm just about ready to go and I pull on the spring a little bit more, adding shear stress on the fault, I can trigger an earthquake. But this only works if I'm close to failure. If I'm not close to failure, lifting a brick does nothing, pulling does nothing. And this tells us, since when we calculate this after big earthquakes, we have stress trigger zones and we have stress shadows where the stress has dropped because we've added a brick or loosened on the uh, rubber band. Because we generally see aftershocks in the stress trigger zones, it tells us that most faults spend most of their lives close to failure. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And because it works, what we can do is calculate how one earthquake changes the stress around it, and therefore where the next earthquakes and aftershocks are likely to be. Okay, now let's put this in action in the Bay Area. Okay, so now let's come back to the slides. So with the lessons of QuakeCaster in mind, let me show you what earthquakes occurred during the 75 years before 1906. And that's as far back as our history goes. And it's complete from about magnitude six and up. And what you see is that earthquakes are ricocheting all over the Bay. Not only the 1868 earthquake at Hayward, but an 1838 earthquake on the San Andreas on the peninsula and many, many others. Now I wanna compare that to the 75 years after the great 1906 earthquake. Almost nothing. The rate of earthquakes dropped by an order of magnitude. So in QuakeCaster's terms, what we can now do is calculate how the stress of that big earthquake changed the conditions for failure on all these faults. And so what happened was that the earthquake put almost all of these parallel faults into its stress shadow. In other words, in all of those blue areas, we've loosened the rubber band or we've added a brick and we brought those faults farther from failure. The trigger zones, places where we've either lifted a brick or pulled on the rubber band are principally beyond the ends of the fault. To the south, you can just begin to see an area that extends down from Hollister uh, towards central California. And at the very northern end of the rupture, way outside of this picture near Cape Mendocino, which is an area that subsequently has had an, an enormous number of earthquakes for the following 75 years. So 
Ironically, ever since 1906, as the population uh, exploded in the Bay Area, we have been living in a unique period of seismic sleep. But as you saw, the gods are cranking on the reel and the stresses have to be rebuilding. Now they've dropped most profoundly on the fault. So they tend to rebuild from the sides in. And this is a picture that is approximately our best understanding of how the stresses are rebuilding today. And many of these faults that you see here in orange and yellow are the ones that are showing moderate and larger earthquakes currently. So what does this mean for those of us who live in the Bay Area now? Well, we are likely headed into a period of, again, much higher earthquake rates. So this might be, at least for me, uh, a moment for a little bit of gallows humor. And then it raises the question, you know, we can laugh it off, but the, really the question is, okay, if earthquakes are in our future in the Bay Area, and of course, lots of other places around the world, how do we live with them safely? How do we build structures that we would enjoy living in, but will treat us well when the ground starts shaking? And that's what I'm gonna show you in the next demo, how buildings respond to earthquakes, because that's what we need to do, build well. You're looking at a building that you can find anywhere in the world. It's made out of stacks of cubes. And even though this building is bolted to the ground, my case with Velcro, which is great, its problem is that no matter how strong you build the columns and the beams, it's only as strong as its weakest corner. And what an earthquake does principally is shake the ground from side to side. And you can see because the corners are weak, this building is extremely weak. And earthquakes also produce torsion. And again, you can see how weak this building is. If any one of these corners breaks, this building is probably coming down. And that's because a cube lacks structural integrity. And by that I mean, look at this, Ikea house. Stick it in your station wagon, drive it home. Now let's put this bad guy aside. This is the exact same building as this one, made the exact same materials, except I've snapped in little corner braces, just with sewing snaps. See, I've just taken this guy out and I can snap him back in. Now look, nothing. This building is a collapse risk. This building is gonna do well. What's the difference in cost? When you build a building, to build this one rather than this one. Think about your guess. It's one to 2%. And even if this is an older building that needs to be retrofitted to come up to this standard, it's only about two to 3%. For a typically home, for typical home, the cost of a half bath. But nobody is gonna go from this building to this building unless they're convinced they're at risk and they see how much this would make their lives safer. So let's take a look at what are the features in buildings that make them safe. So with the model take quake towers in mind, let me show you the epitome of seismic design. Now, why is that so? It's got a tall mast to take the compression loads it's got stainless steel cables to take the tension loads. It's light on top and it's heavy on the bottom. But I'm not talking about the bridge. I'm talking about the boat. Because any sailboat in the bay could handle anything the faults could subject it to. Now you might say, no, 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 no. He's just saying that because the boats will bob around in the water if shaken. No, you're wrong. If I dug a hole in the shape of that hull and I took a crane and I put that boat in that hole and I subjected it to the earthquake, it would be just fine. And that's because it's got a heavy keel on the bottom, but it's light on top. It's made of strong, shear resistant materials, fiberglass. 
It's it's trying. It's got curves and triangles. There's it's not a box, and it's got that tall mast and stainless steel cables. And it's kind of incredible to think why is it that so many buildings in the bay and elsewhere will fare poorly in an earthquake where all the sailboats will do well? And the answer has got to be that if a yacht designer builds a boat and takes it out into the bay and in a typical 25 or 30 knots of wind and chop, it capsizes and goes to the bottom, that designer builds a better boat next year. And so the whole design process is accelerated, the Darwinian process of figuring out how to float a boat and how to resist all the enormous forces that boats get as they're smashed around on waves. But how about buildings? Their earthquakes are rare. They're not in the experience of almost any architect. So it's an entirely different thing. And the difference between your home and the boat even gets stronger if we go inside the saloon. So look at this, inside this boat. There's no sharp corners anywhere. There's handholds everywhere. Everything is curved. All the cabinets are latched. There's no glassware that could go flying around. And even the stove is gimbaled. I could make soup in this boat during the 1906 earthquake. I'd be fine. Now, let's compare this, think about this, to your favorite bar. Okay, here's mine. This bar is a mile from the San Andreas Fault. So it's going to go for quite a ride when that fall ruptures again. But look at it. Look at all those liquor bottles sitting on a glass shelf in front of a glass mirror. These guys shouldn't be in tuxedos. They should be in hard hats. Imagine what this is going to be like when the shaking begins. Now, here's what's interesting. As a geophysicist, I spend a lot of time in Japan because they have earthquakes too. I can't find a bar in Japan that doesn't protect its bottles and its glassware. This, to me, is quake denial. So your homework assignment when COVID is behind us, is to go to a bar and go find a bar that protects its glassware from flying. And you, it'll be really hard, as it is really hard in the Bay, because we aren't really owning up to the modest things we need to do to make ourselves safer. Okay, so uh, um, lauding the features of a, of a boat, I should say, Okay, not all boats are built the right way. Here's one that you've seen, houseboat. Now, if you took this thing into the bay in any summer afternoon and you turned it broadside to the wind and the chop, it would almost certainly capsize, all those ports would break, and it too would go to the bottom. So if there were justice in the world, this would be its naval architect being pooped out its anus. But here's the bad news. Most of us are simply living in beached houseboats, and it shouldn't be this way, and it doesn't have to be this way. Seismic design can be beautiful, and you know already why this building is strong. All those triangles, all the lightness of it. Um, we do not have to consign ourselves to fortresses to live well in earthquake country. Now, here's where I want to leave you. Um, our company, Tembler, builds a free iPhone and Android app and web app, which is designed to help anyone anywhere on Earth understand their seismic hazard. So, for example, here it is, we're Tembler.net. And this is my home. I have a score of 55 out of 100. The higher the score, uh, the, bad, the, the worse it is. And you can see here the... Uh, what is my likely earthquake in my lifetime? What that will cost me? How that cost would be lowered if I retrofitted my home? And how my out-of-pocket expenses could be reduced if I insured that home? And how a retrofit home reduces my chance of injury? Now, let me just take two examples, one close to my home, one close to your home. So this is my mom's condominium. So I let my mom buy a condominium on the Santa Monica Fall. I'm an idiot, or at least a hypocrite. How could I have done that? And the answer is, it was kind of hard to put all this information together and get it clear.
clearly and easily. And that's why we built the app. It shouldn't be hard. So we gather this data and we make it understandable and available to anyone who'd like to know what their situation is. So they don't go into an area that liquefies in an earthquake like the Marina del Rey or this river basin. Okay, finally, Portland. So I put the, the pin at Beaverton. When you open the app, it automatically finds your location. It automatically reaches out and grabs attributes of your home. You don't have to populate anything. It'll tell you. So we're telling you here, your score is 43 out of 100, lower than my mom and lower than, my, than me. That's good. You might expect about a 6.1 in your lifetime, but there are some faults here, such as the uh, East Bank fault, the Portland Hills fault, which are capable of magnitude seven earthquakes, just very infrequently. And if they occurred for a $600,000 home, that's the price of rebuilding it, not the price of buying the land. We would expect if it's an old home, older than built before 1950, $280,000 to repair. But if you would retrofit that home, that drops the repair cost by $100,000. And retrofit usually costs three to $4,000. So that's a good deal. And similarly, if you'd insured the home, even with a 15% deductible, your out-of-pocket expenses drop by almost $200,000. So we're showing you what you can do to make yourself safer. Okay, in closing, I first want to acknowledge the wonderful people who helped make the demos and who are my colleagues in Tembler and my research colleagues, and also to acknowledge the generous funding from IRIS and the Seismological Society of America and the National Science Foundation, which also funds Tembler for um, this presentation. Now let's just let me make a closing remark. So I hope you've seen tonight that California's beauty, its wealth, its climate, and its history are inseparable from its seismic setting. The Bay Area's profound losses in 1906 were, ironically, science's gain. So to repay that debt, we need to transform the most hazardous regions in the world, including this one in Oregon, into the most resilient by mitigation and better seismic design and construction. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for that amazing talk, Dr. Stein. Well, I'm looking forward to any questions that people have. Yeah, I see you got your demo table set up there. Um, <laughs> anybody has any questions at all, uh, please put them in the chat for either Facebook or YouTube. If you chat those questions, I can ask, ask Dr. Stein. And it looks like maybe you can do some more, use, use some props if you have any questions that involve props, maybe. <laughs> Um, so our first question is, does any type of human activity contribute to earthquake activity? It's a great question. And the answer is yes, we have induced seismicity associated with not so much fracking, but the reinjection of the very toxic fracking fluids deep in the earth. So in places like Oklahoma, we now have more earthquakes in Oklahoma than we have in California. And those are associated with reinjection of those fracking fluids. Now, fortunately thus far, we've only had a magnitude 5.8, but there's no real reason why we couldn't have a larger earthquake associated with fracking. And it's not restricted to Oklahoma. We see this in Canada and many other parts of the world. The other powerful example of human induced earthquakes are impounding reservoirs with dams and filling uh, large areas with water and the weight of the water and also the water seeping in the fault zone and making it slippery has triggered earthquakes at least up to magnitude six and a half and possibly in China, Wenchang, China in uh, 2008 when there was a magnitude 7.9.
It's another great question. So the short answer is probably yes. Hold on, I'm gonna have you pause quick. It looks like maybe we lost audio. <laughs> I'll wait and have you answer when, when there's audio back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm seeing there's some comments. I think Jason might need to fix the audio. Jason says we're good. Okay, we're back, everyone. If you hey. saw my moving, right. don't worry. Should you live on a ridgetop or should you live in a basin? So here's the story. Basins are just flat areas on Earth are bowls that are filled with sediments. The Earth doesn't like a hole. It fills it with sediments. And those sediments, particularly if they're young and loose and water saturated, they can liquefy and they can shape very, very hard. So in general, if you're in a basin, like the Seattle Basin, there's the Portland Basin, Los Angeles Basin, these amplify the shaking. The, the waves can ring back and forth. The most amazing example of this is Mexico City. Mexico City is built on a lake bed. It's basically a water bed. It's 70% water. And the shaking is 10 times higher than the ridge areas around it. However, here's the tricky part. In the um, earthquake that we had in Nepal near Kathmandu a few years ago, a lot of the ridge tops suffered fairly strong shaking. So there is a phenomena that causes seismic waves to kind of reverberate inside ridges. However, if I had to choose where to live, I would choose a ridge over a basin. Okay. Um, so hopefully that person is, is relatively safe on that ridge over the Columbia. Um, Someone's asking, do earthquakes that happen on land masses create tsunamis? Okay, so great question again. So tsunamis always involve underwater movement of the earth, either lifting or dropping to the seafloor, which, which can cause a wave to come inshore, or sometimes triggering an undersea landslide. Uh, that landslide can even start above ground, but if you have a huge amount of rock debris uh, that goes into the ocean, this causes uh, you typically a local, but often very high amplitude tsunami. But if you have an earthquake on land and you are not near the ocean, it's, it's impossible to produce a tsunami. And even most of the earthquakes that occur offshore don't produce a tsunami. Certain special kind of earthquakes uh, are the tsunami, um, the deadly tsunami cases. And they're usually ones where there's a lot of displacement very close to the shore and that it's relatively fast. Great, thank you. Um, Another sort of question about earthquakes and that kind of stuff, where it happens. Um, can you expect more earthquakes near volcanoes? And I don't know if this person is thinking of specifically active volcanoes or just volcanoes in general. So active volcanoes do produce earthquakes. They produce some wonderful, fascinating, exotic earthquakes. So there's something called harmonic tremor which is caused by the gases and fluids in the conduit moving up and down just like a pipe organ in a church and producing a harmonious kind of seismic single, signal, not an impulsive one. It was kind of like the music produced by volcanoes and many, many volcanoes show this and often before an eruption, you get a lot more of this harmonic tremor because gases and fluids are working their way to the top. But in general, if we look around the world, Japan, the Philippines, parts of the Pacific Northwest, yes, volcanoes tend to be associated with earthquakes because they produce huge deformation of the crust, very, very strong stresses. Obviously, if you're near a volcano, the earthquake isn't the only thing to worry about, but earthquakes often give it away. The 1991, 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines was called was a forecast on the basis of 
earthquakes not only occurring, but getting closer and closer and closer to the surface. And the entire U.S. Air Base, the Clark Air Force Base, was evacuated 11 hours before the eruption. So, you know, there is a case in which earthquakes gave away, among other things, the signal that we were about to have a big eruption, and so many lives were saved. Wow. Uh, so do you think for us living in Portland, should we be more worried about uh, a volcano or an earthquake? <laughs> Because Mount St. Helens so close. Well, in most respects, uh, living in this beautiful location, you're lucky because volcanoes are magnificent crustal features and uh, you have the offshore subduction zone, but the crustal faults around you are not nearly as active. They have maybe somewhere between one-tenth and one-hundredth the slip rate of the faults in California. So earthquakes do occur, and if you look at a similar kind of location in Japan, onshore from a subduction zone, you also see earthquakes occurring. But eruptions are probably uh, equally important. Equally important because they produce ash flows and many other things. But we would never, we should never ignore the possibility of a big subduction event. And that event, because the earthquake is large and the shaking would continue for a long time, would still shake an area like Portland strongly. Oh, thanks. Um, one person is asking, they say they have a one and a half story residence built in 1950 and are wondering if a DIY retrofit is possible or uh, that should be done by a pro. All right, that's a great question. So it's wonderful that you're thinking about a retrofit. That's the way to think about this. And if you're really good at DIY, and if it's not a very peculiar building, like built on a slope or um, has a foundation that's river rock or something like that, then there are plans, there are standard plans you can use. And if you're skilled, you know, you're basically putting plywood in and you're nailing around the edges, you're putting anchor bolts in, you're putting other kind of secondary anchors. I think someone who's skilled could do it and you'd save, save yourself um, a little bit of money. But there are companies that just do this. And it's if you've ever been down to your crawl space, it's, it's not my favorite place. So if somebody's willing to do this at a reasonable amount, just get it done. Just get it done and you'll be safer. And think about this. One of the things great about retrofit is it should add to the value of the building. If you get insurance, which is also a good idea, at the end of the year, it has no value. So retrofit makes you safer because things are less likely to fall on you. And in a good world, the next person who buys the house will, will value the fact that you've made it, brought it up to code. So there's a double benefit of retrofit. So you gotta live in this, point. not this. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, let's see. Got a couple more questions here. I'll ask you another one about building stuff. Um, what public policy would you recommend to mitigate these risks? And is there any organization that lobbies for such policy, like tax credits, building codes, et cetera? God, such a great question. So for 30 years, I worked at the US Geological Survey, uh, which is a wonderful organization, but we could never answer that question because we cannot advocate we can only provide information. Um, uh, I, well, the, um, the GEM Foundation, the Global Earthquake Model Foundation, which is based in Pavia, Italy, is not a lobbying group, but a group that's trying to help worldwide assessment and communication about seismic risk. Um, there are various governmental agencies, but I could name them in California off the top of my tongue, but I'm not sure I would name the right ones in Oregon. Um, but e where would you go uh, to find this information? I, I would say that the problem that Oregon faces is that there are business interests that do not want to restrict development in the tsunami zone and do not want to require retrofit of commercial and residential 
and apartment buildings. The argument is, oh, this will increase the cost of real estate and it's already too high. And by not occupying and putting buildings in the tsunami zone, this will limit the development in a beautiful part of the state that is uh, attractive to tourism. And, and of course, this is a crazy point of view. We should learn to live safely with earthquakes because after the earthquake, there'll be no tourism if everything falls over. And if you're down in the tsunami zone and you end up just being flotsam and jetsam out at sea, tourism is gonna be good for you there either. So it's a wonderful question because you, the person who is asking it realizes you have to fight for these things and citizens have to stand up. It's a difficult time to take on this task, but um, we know it's coming. We know earthquakes are in our future. And if we make ourselves safer now, we'll be thanked for it later. Yeah, it's a great message. Um, with oceans rising, will the extra weight of the water near a fault line increase the possibility of an earthquake? Oh, another great question. So um, in California, during the drought, when we had the water table dropping, we could see the entire state rising up because it's like a cork floating in the water and we were shaving stuff off the cork and so it was rising and we could see the small earthquakes responding to this change stress. In Greenland, all along the southern boundary of Greenland, we now see earthquakes where we never did and those are be they're basically ice quakes associated with the flow of the glacier ice out of the Greenland basin. So we are seeing some effects, but the, the question is real issue is, well, what if we just raise water level? What is that gonna mean? And um, it probably isn't important for strike slip faults, but it probably is important for thrust faults and subduction zones because the weight of that water keeps the fault unclamped. If you remove that water, you might unclamp the fault. There's a flip side of the coin that water, if it can percolate into the fault zone, makes it slippery. So if you reduce the pressure that's pushing the water in the fault zone, maybe you would actually clamp a fault. So it's a complicated business to figure out what the climate signal is in earthquake occurrence. I would say that the real climate signal in earthquake occurrence is that people are being driven into cities out of areas that are getting too hot. And so we are concentrating the population in too few locations. And those locations would become sites of truly catastrophic earthquakes. So the concentration of population in the big cities, or earthquake prone cities around the world, Istanbul, Jakarta, uh, uh, Min, uh, Mindanao, uh, Tokyo, Santiago, these are attributes of climate change that will play themselves out in the high vulnerability of these areas to earthquakes. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a general scientific paradigm question for you. <laughs> uh, why did it take scientists so long to accept continental drift? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> so it really, ironically, it took so long for scientists to reject continental drift and replace it with plate tectonics. So Wegener, who, uh, who promulgated the idea that the continents were pushing their way through the oceanic crust and moving around, was a brilliant critic of the dogma of the day. But he used the same kind of triangulation data that I described to argue that the continents were moving at meters a year, when reality they were moving at millimeters a year. So he used the same data, but he used it incorrectly at about the same time that we used it correctly. Incidentally, Wegener was aware of the 1906 earthquake in Reed's work, and he marshaled that evidence for continental drift. The continental drift was rejected because people couldn't see how the continents could plow their way through the oceanic crust. What happened to create the conditions for this massive discovery was 
new data coming from the seafloor, magnetic data that said that the seafloor had to be pulling apart. Ironically, some of it was promoted by the Cold War. Uh, bathymetry, good bathymetry maps were, were needed to chase submarines. And some of it was slowed down by the Cold War because so much of that vital data was classified. So a lot of things came together very, very fast. It's incredible to think that the world changed utterly between 1962 and 1966. Wow. Um, okay. Next question. Sorry, I'm trying to scroll through a bunch here. Let's see. Someone wants to know if you can somehow weld the tectonic plates together to end earthquakes. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, the short answer is no, because the, the uh, energy of an earthquake is so massive that it would be impossible. You know, we've never, the largest bomb ever or nuclear blast ever exploded still only amounts to about a, like a 6.2 earthquake. And a, the, the Tohoku magnitude nine earthquake is um, 30,000 times larger than that. So it's a numbers game. You know, we don't have enough welders out there to put the crust together. And ultimately the crust is moving because it's sliding downhill it's, it's a little higher at the mid-ocean ridges. It's deeper under the continents. It's sliding down. There's goo underneath it. And that goo is being moved by a slow kind of random turbulence in the outer core and the mantle. So there's really no way to stop plate tectonics. But some people have said, well, why don't you just lubricate all the faults? They'll move, but they won't produce earthquakes. And that's a little bit more realistic, but the problem is be careful what you do. If you don't do anything to a fault and produces an earthquake, it's not your fault. But if you lubricate a fault and you actually make an earthquake possible, you're it. You're sued. So in reality, it's, it's aside from just testing that we can inject into faults and see that earthquakes turn on and off, nobody really wants to try an experiment like that. And it would be colossally expensive and probably colossally stupid to try. So this is sort of getting at another related question we had where they're wondering if the big earthquake is because that rubber band keeps like twisting and twisting until it snaps, is there a way to sort of set off more frequent low intensity earthquakes so the rubber band can kind of unstretch a little bit, but a little at a time? So it doesn't sort of, we don't have that really big event. It's a great question, but the numbers are against you. So the problem is, let's think of that magnitude eight on the San Andreas in 1906 and compare that to a magnitude um, four. It's, it's a factor of a million. So if you, could, if you could do something that would knock off a magnitude five every single day, maybe a five and a half or a six, then you could get rid of the need for an eight. There's nowhere on earth where we have small earthquakes occurring that rate. So with the exception of that part along the San Andreas, the creeping section that produces really, really little earthquakes at a very high frequency, even those are just accompanying the slip. So it doesn't look like there's any way by promoting small earthquakes, we can get rid of the big ones. The big ones are doing most of the work. The little ones are just telling us that this fault is active. It's alive. It's capable of something big. Nice, thanks. Um, There's been an interest in building small, quote, sky crate scrapers, but with wooden framing. Are wood structures safer than steel? Well, I'm not a structural engineer, so I'm a geophysicist. This is kind of as far as I go in terms of understanding buildings. Um, what I am seeing and what the questioner is probably seeing is it's more and more frequent as you drive around, you see five or six story uh, apartment buildings, office buildings being built out of wood. 
And in principle, wood has the benefit that it's flexible, and therefore it's not stiff and brittle. But once you start to build taller and taller, you have other objectives that you have to meet. So I think an engineer would say that wood is probably inadequate for really tall buildings, that they need to be steel, and that steel needs to be understood in terms of how it behaves. So I don't think we're going to see wood frame buildings over about a half a dozen floors in earthquake country. Thanks. Um, do engineers such as those designing structures of high weight like dams take the risk of triggering earthquakes into account when determining whether a location is a good choice for the proposed structure? Mm. That's a good question. So there are environmental impact reports that have to be uh, uh, submitted when a large dam or bridge or structure of any kind is uh, contemplated. But what often happens is you don't see the earthquakes until you start filling the dam. And there's a case of this in the California uh, Sierra Foothills in Oroville Dam, the largest dam that was ever built in California. Once they started filling it, it started to produce earthquakes. And ultimately they had to give up on the dam. The dam has, I don't know, never been more than one fifth full. And during the drought period, they tried to push harder to fill the dam. And uh, they were unsuccessful because of this risk, because it's not just that you're producing earthquakes. If you produce an earthquake that goes through the dam footing, you can burst the dam. So dams are a very, very special case. If a bridge goes down, the people who are on the bridge go with it. But if a dam goes down, everybody downstream is affected. So dams are the place where you have to look at this most carefully and where it's most difficult to assess. Yeah, that's a great consideration. Um, a few more questions. Let's see. Mm -hmm. From surveys, have any areas on the Pacific Northwest coast been identified that could experience the excess tsunami height from a submarine landslide, like certain areas in Japan during the next Cascadia earthquake? So that's a great question. And so bathymetric surveys, surveys of accurate surveys of the seafloor would reveal the presence of past landslides and it's probably a good bet that if you see a place where a landslide occurred in the past, then it could occur again. There's, so there's probably work that's being done to try to map undersea landslides. It takes very uh, uh, accurate bathymetric maps to do that. So there, and then of course the other side of that coin is if you've had a giant undersea landslide that's triggered a tsunami, there may be tsunami deposits on the coast inland that a geologist could find to indicate that yes, there was a tsunami that inundated an area. And that, as you may know, the uh, discovery of the magnitude nine, 17, the 1700, year 1700 magnitude nine Cascadia earthquake was made by the discovery of drowned trees and sand layers all along the California, the uh, Oregon and Washington coast by Brian Atwater. And he dated those to be roughly 1600 to 1800 AD. And he said, well, I can't go any further. I don't even know if they're all the same event or events over, stretched over a long period of time. And he was talking to a Japanese colleague. And he said, it may be prehistoric for you, but it's historic for us. If you had a magnitude nine, that tsunami would have gone all across the Pacific and would have hit the Japanese harbors. And he brought in a historian of ancient Japanese and they found the records all along the Japanese coast of what they call an orphan phenomen, a tsunami that hit at that time. So geological evidence at the surface, in addition to bathymetry would crack that problem. Thanks. Um, would it be possible to put together, or what would it take to put together a warning system like there is in Mexico City? 
Well, um, fortunately, there's an earthquake early warning system that has now begun in California, and most of us have the MyShake app on our phone, along with the Timber app. Um, and I believe that will be coming to Oregon and Washington soon. And so, in principle, earthquake early warning will give us some number of seconds before the earthquake strikes. A few seconds, maybe 10 seconds. Enough time, hopefully, to drop cover and hold on. So this is a heavy table, and if I had those seconds, I would just get under this table right here. That's all I do. I wouldn't run out of my house or anything like that. And so earthquake early warning is a way to uh, improve your safety at the time of the earthquake. So it's coming. Offshore earthquakes produce uh, special problems because we really need offshore seismometers to, and offshore GPS receivers to detect that earthquake before it hits the shore where we are. But that's also coming too with cabled underwater instruments. So I think all of this we will see soon, hopefully in time for the next large subduction event. Thanks. Um, ooh, here's a question that, uh, oh, okay, related to computer science. Uh, does Moore's law apply to earthquake computational analysis? Is prediction capability doubling approximately every two years? That's an interesting point. I mean, like every other science, the earth sciences have become a big data science where uh, very large computers are in on the act. The California earthquake hazard model is built using, at the time, a few years ago, the largest supercomputers in the United States. So um, computational tools, people who understand computation, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning are in much demand. And I would say that to anybody who's thinking about the earth sciences, uh, we would love to have you. And the, most of the problems are unsolved. We don't know how to predict earthquakes. You know, we're groping around in the dark. We know way too little. And so there's a possibility of breakthroughs and big data is going to be a part of that. And using some of these modern techniques you know, not to figure out which Netflix movie you want, but how to solve the earthquake problem would be a great contribution to make. So join us. That was a wonderful call. Study earth science. Um, That's right. Let's see. I think I might only have one more question. If you're still with us and you have any questions, here's one of my final calls for questions. Um, this person's asking, it looks like their home is relatively low risk. It's only rated 13. That's um, great. Would, is there any recommended retrofitting you'd say even for low risk spaces like that? So in our app, we show you the risk, which is probabilistic. You know, what are the chances of experience strong shaking in your lifetime? But we also look at what the other problem, which is if your fault capable of the strongest shaking to you, what would that mean? So what we do is we look at all possible earthquakes and we find the earthquake that would most strongly shake your house. And we tell you how a retrofit or how insurance would affect you there. And if that earthquake is very rare, insurance costs will be very low. And um, if it's rare but damaging, retrofit can still be good. Um, so I, I would say it's look closely at what we show you and see if it looks to you like it's worthwhile. And you can always get an estimate. What is it going to cost to retrofit my home? And you might find that you don't need much or you might find, oh, this is prohibitive. Great. Well, Thank you so, so much, Dr. Stein. That is all the questions that I see. And that was a lot of questions too. Thanks for going through all of those different various uh, subjects with us. Well, it's been a, a great night for me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I'll be thrilled if any one of you goes into the earth sciences um, inspired to uh, teach us more about earthquakes than we now know. That's how we find out. Yeah. 
Um, okay, everyone at home, we are out of time. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's event. If you would like to watch this video again or share it with your friends, check out the videos section on Momsy's Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from Momsy. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. And, and also and please join today. Oops, sorry. Please join yeah. us next Tuesday, July 28th, for a lecture on the cold waters of the Southern Ocean and the most vibrant marine ecosystem on the planet with Paul North, the founder of Meet the Ocean. Once again, Thank you to our partner Celestream for making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at omzi.edu. Dr. Stein, did you have any last words? No, I th except that Jen did a great job on the trivia contest. Oh, yes. She is a trivia master, even in real life, uh, not just when we make her do trivia for her job. <laughs> nice. uh, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful night.